Welcome to Wine Soundtrack South Africa. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Morena Kahlo and today I'm joined by Billy Hughes from Nativo Wines. Billy, a very warm welcome. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Oh, um, I'm born in Argentina. I uh, studied uh, engineering um, in, in Argentina and, and then um, Argentina had a, a lot of inflation problems in the 90s and we had a small company that we decided to close because we couldn't cope with inflation. And we, we retrenched all the people, we decided to, to close, I didn't have any other job to get in Argentina, we didn't want to start another company. so. I decided to travel around the world and I bought a ticket and my first stop was Cape Town and I'm still here. Okay, I'll get them to edit that out. Okay, so an Argentinian makes his way to Cape Town and never leaves. But how did you start a winery or a wine business? Where did that come from? I'm, uh, my dad is from, uh, or was from Mendoza, so the wine area of Argentina, and we always had nice wines at home, and we always enjoyed wine. And when I came to South Africa, I started doing the Cape Wine Academy courses and really got into into um, the wine scene. We had a little group that we did to do regular tastings, and then uh, one year we had, I had visitors from Argentina, friends of mine, and when, before they left they said, why don't we start a winery? So I did. I started looking for farms and uh, see if we can do something like that. Eventually they couldn't join the project because there were other issues in Argentina that couldn't help them. So then I, I went on my own and we found this beautiful piece of land in Swartland and and that was year 2000, and that's the way we started. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, so tell me about Nativo, the farm. How did you, how did you come up with this name? Nativo uh, means uh, native in, in Spanish. And uh, the name came because of me being here in South Africa, uh, a sense of origin, also from the beginning we decided to do natural yeast and very natural fermentation and also the name is because of those native yeast. So around that, uh, uh, around my sense of belonging, coming to South Africa, natural things, being native. I like that. It's very, very, very original and you were one of the early adopters of natural winemaking techniques here in South Africa, weren't you? Yes, um, we, we, from the beginning we've been organic, so we, we started in, in 2000, I think the first year we, we spray a herbicide because we had to, there were so many weeds in the farm. The, the farm didn't have any vineyards, it was just a, a weed farm and, and we, we started the, with the organic philosophy from the beginning. And also it being part of the Swartland and talking in those early days to the other nice guys that that make wine in Swartlands, they always had this Mediterranean simplicity approach to one making, no no additive, very, very clean, very linear, very pure. And in terms of the farm size, how many hectares are under vineyard? The farm is 53 hectares, it's uh, 10 kilometers north of Malmesbury. It is planted with uh, 27 hectares of vineyard and we have, uh, on the whites we have uh, Viognier, Chenin Blanc, Roussan and Grenache Blanc. And then on the reds we have Syrah, Mouvedre, Pinotage, Grenache Blanc and Tempranillo. So really a lot of Mediterranean varieties planted there and then a bit of pinotage in just for South, some South African flair. Roughly what is your annual production in terms of bottles or cases? We try to do uh, at the moment uh, 10,000 to 15,000 bottles but uh, 
we, it's always, uh, I guess, it depends on the season. We we are dry land uh, viticulture, and it's so difficult to to um, to ensure that you have a consistent production. We we had two big droughts over the last 20 years, and every time we have that drought, we the production is n nothing, and then it takes you like two three years to come back to full production. So. But but that's I am at the moment ten to twelve thousand bottles and um, in two or three years time a little bit more try to get the twenty four thousand bottles. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of your markets, uh, we can get your wine of course in South Africa. But where else would our listeners potentially be able to find your wine? The um, over the last year and a half we are exporting much more than we used to do, and I think that is. Uh, on the back of the organic. We, we find that the organic movement is really paying off. We started 20 years ago, but only now we can see that there's a real demand or even um, a requirement sometimes to, to supply organic wines. So exporting, we, are, we have two importers in UK, we are busy with um, two in Canada. Um, one in the US starting soon. We've been sending wines to the islands, Mauritius, Seychelles, and Belgium a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, we have a few inquiries at the moment, so it's looking very good, uh, exports at the moment. That's really, really positive. And I must say, you know, organic winemaking in South Africa, wine farming in South Africa is, is challenging uh, for many and that's why we don't have that many who, who do farm organically or cert no, certainly certifiably so. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge in the local climate? The, to farm organic, uh, organically you have to be relatively disciplined. Uh, you, for example, Fungus is the, the biggest problem that you have, and water in our case. So with fungus, you're only allowed to spray copper and sulfur. And those two products are preventative products. So if you have an infestation, you're not going to fix it with copper and sulfur. So you have to be upfront and preventing it from happening. So what you do is you look at the weather and if rain is coming in two or three days time, well, you spray now and you get ready for the, for the rain. And then if you have to and the rain has been big, you spray immediately after. But other than that, it's not difficult. It is just being smart and it is not more expensive. Uh, and, the, and on the weed side, just controlling the weeds without using a herbicide means that you have to have the right machine to scuffle under the vines or, or use a lot of people to do manual scuffling. But the benefits is looking at the vineyard now. For example, if you go to the vineyard now in spring, it's full of flowers and a lot of life around. We have a lot of bark and hairs uh, moving around. It's wonderful to see how different the vineyard is compared to some of my neighbors. My neighbors um, just spray herbicides non-stop and w when you go driving past the vineyard at the moment it looks like a moonscape. There's nothing green. It's just brown. It's, it's so sad to see. And then you come into a vineyard and you have bees around and everything happy and uh, looking good. <laughs> Happy and looking good. I really like that. <laughs> I can see the the bees smiling in your vineyards. <laughs> um, Billy, you're an engineer by trade. What what hold was it that wine had on you to start? It's you know it's a it's a huge commitment over and above the day job. Why wine? And 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 what was it about this this product of ours? Yeah, um, it's a, it's a wine is an incredible wine and wine business is an incredible uh, industry. It's one of the few industries where you can combine so many things. You can combine food, uh, art, science, engineering, every, everything t together. You go to some other wineries 
and, and they are amazing piece of architecture and art. They're wonderful to see. And you don't see that in many industries. You don't see industries where you, everything is combined so seamlessly. And it's also a very good home for the organic movement. Organic movement, besides the vegetables and all the things that are growing now, the organic and biodynamic movements are uh, well anchored in the, in the wine industry. It's just a nice host. And it's a bit of, of, a, of a luxury item. It's um, indulgent. It's, it's, it's a passion. So, it, and it fits very well with engineering. My engineering is a, a day-to-day. You never know what's going to happen. We usually do a one-off high technology equipment for underwater uh, mining and, and uh, windmills and offshore equipments and then you have the the farming and the wine making which although it's still full of uncertainties there is a pace and you know what's going to happen we just finished pruning now i know that a month's time i start spraying and with canopy management and then we get to the harvest so so this within chaos there's a routine about it and the 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 chance of every year learning more and improving and improving and and making a nice nice product something nice to drink mm. so the challenge that turns into something that's very rewarding in the end uh, it is there's nothing better than um, just tasting using the thief open a barrel a, a barrel and tasting the wine and say oh it's looking good <laughs> i do like that in terms of wine drinking um, are there any wines that you've enjoyed at any stage in your life, like a standout wine that brings back a particular memory or takes you back to a specific place that you that really leaves this kind of mark that you can highlight? Yeah, look, coming from Argentina, <clears throat> I'm kind of very used to the, the Merlot and the, also the Tempranillos. And it... At the beginning, or many years ago in Argentina, I used to drink and kind of know a little bit about them. And one of the guys that really uh, made a difference to us was our family doctor uh, in Argentina, in Mendoza. He was helping my sister um, uh, uh, with health issues, and he was also making Malbec, and I remember because uh, I used to ask him, "How do you do the Malbec?" And he says, "No, I just press the grapes and I put them in a the barrel, and that's it." And I said, "But don't you put SO2 and don't you?" No, he didn't put anything, and the wines were awesome. And I remember that the that one can actually do a wine with a really, really basic. Um, talents without using anything so there you are Malbec I think it's my my child uh, wine mm-hmm. yes that is quite quite a story just just press it and put it in the barrel and that's that I mean if only everything in life would be that easy <laughs> um, Billy what is your most expensive wine in your range we are um, producing an orange wine that um, retails at, it trades at, at 250 rand per bottle, so they're not expensive wines. And that one, uh, and then we do every year, we select one or two barrels that are really nice, interesting, and we bottle them on the own, be it a Tempranillo or a, or a Mouvedre or a Syrah, and we do a limit. Um, release of those wines only 400 bottles of them and then also retail for 250 rand all the other ones are um, trading at 180 and then we have a, um, a new range the birds and the bees which are both blends and sorry no the the pieces is, is straight in here and when those are 150, 160 bucks. Okay, so all very, very pocket friendly and very approachable from from that perspective. So you mentioned uh, going into your cellar with a wine thief and just tasting something from the barrel. Right now, 
if you had to walk into your cellar, which wine? And and it's it's this is a current thing. This is not asking you who's your favorite child, but right now, which one gives you the most joy with that when you kind of go in there with a thief? We have <clears throat> at the moment. Last year, we had a terrible harvest. Uh, we had three months of of no rain, so our harvest was very, very poor. So we could only harvest a couple of tons for ourselves. And the the one that produced well was a Tempranillo. And with the Tempranillo, we decided to vinify it in many different ways to understand um, how really to manage it. We have it first very early, so it was 1920 Valley, which is unusual for a red. And then we did two different approaches to one making. We did fully distilled and then whole bunch fermentation. So, so fully distilled, the, the grapes arrive in the cellar, we put them through the distemmer, so all the, the skins are more or less broken, and then they go into fermented like that, so broken skins, no stockies, and, and just the juice and the skin in contact, and you would expect uh, from that wine something that is more tannic, more deeper in color, because you have a lot of exposure to, to tannins. And the other one, we, we do about 30-40% of whole bunch fermentation. That means that before we, we put the distemmed uh, or yeah, the distemmed juice and skins on it, the first 30% of the tank we put whole bunches. That means as they come from the vineyards, we did a, do a little bit of sorting and then the bunches go into the fermenter. We cover it with the distem and we do the fermentation like that. And that's what we're watching at the moment. We're watching the competition between the full distem and the whole bunch uh, wines. The, the whole bunch at the moment, and this is only six months after harvest, they're looking beautiful with an elegance, finesse, uh, subtle. Uh, the distem one, a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit more character, a little bit darker. And uh, so we probably going to bottle them separately. We're going to have a Tempranillo with the same vintage, one distem and one whole bunch, and we go like that. Isn't it incredible to see how something so simple actually gives you something so different and so unique? Um, and, and that's what makes it winemaking just exciting. Um, as a consumer, what do you enjoy drinking? Red, white, yeah. Yes, no, anything. Um, it, what we do, uh, we get together usually with the Swartland guys and, and we do shows together. So we go around and taste each other wines. And the, I don't have any specific preference. I just, um, I just taste all the wines that are that have any meaning of or significance so I'm very open to uh, experiment what was the best bottle that I drank many years ago it was a Fiesenhof ah. Sauvignon Blanc in a Magnum and I got it from a bottle store in Harpei from Lydia and um, and kind of she was giving them kind of a half price because they were too old and um, and she said, no, oh, you can take it, it's too old to, to sell and everything. And it was awesome. So <laughs> there you are. It's so interesting. I wish we could see more large format bottlings because, you know, that Magnum just absolutely lets it live longer. And then the sadness of hearing this kind of thing, it's too old. South African white wines can age so beautifully and it's just a it's a sad reality that the consumers uh, in South Africa just don't see that in particular when it comes to Sauvignon Blanc there's this feeling that it's like it's current year or previous year and anything beyond that it's just that's it and and then you hear stories like this where you, you just kind of go, I wish people would hold on to these wines just a bit longer because they do become so expressive. Absolutely. Uh, the other day um, at home, down in the cellar, I have a couple of, of the red. Every year we, we put away like a, 
a case of 12 of, of the, that vintage. And I was drinking the other day, 2005, 2006, white blend. So that's Yonier, Chenin Blanc, uh, Roussin, some of them we have Verde Verdelo also. And they're awesome, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, there you go. What can we do? Um, in terms of uh, food and wine pairing, your wines are very, you, you, a lot of your white grapes, especially, as you just mentioned, are aromatic. And I would imagine pair really well with food. Um, do you follow a recipe when it comes to food and wine pairing, or is it something that you just more enjoy playing with? Are you, do you play in the kitchen? Is that something... I, I, I'm not cooking much uh, these days, but we are continuously looking at what pairs we, with our wines. Um, the um, so, and, and we do a lot of we do events where we do. It's about food pairing with the different wines. The wine that at the moment that is really interesting is the our orange wine. It's a it's a wine that is made by fermenting the skins only. So. The, the difference between our orange wine and other orange wines from Georgia or, or Friuli or other countries is that they would um, distem the grapes and then leave them the, the skin in contact with the juice for, for a long time and during fermentation and the, you, you get our, what we call it, skin macerated wines. We do it in a different way. We, we uh, bring the white grapes into the cellar, we distem them, they go to the press, where we're going to press out the juice that is going to become the conventional white wine. And the skins, the skins that are left over from the press, we put them in a fermentum, fermenter and we let them ferment on their own. So it's very unusual and risky. And out, out of six fermenters, probably two, we lose them to VA and other hojos. And, um, and then we get the otherwise successfully fermenting. And we find that it's a beautiful wine for food pairing at the moment because we find the sommeliers when they run out of ideas for a specific dish to pair with other conventional wine, it seems that the orange wine really works. So we're having a lot of fun. And at the moment we have one or two restaurants uh, now, this week and next week, that they're actually going to do specific pairings of our orange wines with food. That sounds very, very interesting indeed. Um, you mentioned just now drinking wine with the other Swatland winemakers, and I know what they like. So I'd like you to ask you whether you have a hangover cure. Well, no. <laughs> I usually have to drive back to uh, uh, Cape Town after we have those events, so I never have time to really uh, drink too much. But uh, yeah, they they have we have lovely parties, awesome wines that we we taste there, and in general they're all well behaved, so we never get too much out of hand. <laughs> so a UFO lands on your farm. A UFO. A UFO. Mm -hmm. And the aliens that come out of this UFO are very, very thirsty. What would you give them to drink? I, we have a 2,000 litres at the moment of uh, Viognier, a stainless steel tank with Viognier and a little bit of what we call a field blend. Field blend is we have a, a bush vine block where it's planted with uh, Roussin Grenache Blanc and Chenin Blanc. And when we started planting the blog, we, we, we knew exactly what road wa was what. And so we have four rows of each and we knew exactly what was that and the idea was to harvest them separately. Now they're all mixed because we had replanted after drought and, and so it's a big mess. So we harvest everything together and that's why we call it a field blend. So this tank at the moment has a beautiful um, Viognier together with probably 15% of the field blend is drinking awesome. So the my friends, uh, the UFO guys can drink it all. <laughs> all of it. I <laughs> love that. Um, when you were little, 
What did you want to be when you grew up? I, um, I think very soon um, I wanted to be an engineer. I think from the beginning I knew that I wanted to do something technical. Um, and, um, and on those days I never thought about making wine or having a farm. But my dad was an agriculture engineer and he always, when he went around on tours uh, visiting clients and suppliers and farmers, he used to take us with us. So farming and agriculture was all, always very close to me. But I think engineering from the beginning was something that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And when you're not busy being an engineer and working on a wine farm, what do you do with yourself? We uh, we have another project uh, working with a friend. We are trying to um, improve happiness in older people. So we're trying to... Um, it's a startup company where we're trying to... Uh, create a device and a quality system to find out how we're going to make the life of the older people in the final days of their lives happier. And that takes me, um, absorbs a lot of, uh, of my time. And then I go walking, cycling a little bit. I used to run a lot, now I can't. Um, food, friends, um, yeah. Very nice. What an incredible project to to be part of. I mean, wow, it's actually given me goosebumps all over. Very, very awesome. Um, are you? Do you follow any sport? Any any specific teams that you follow? Dare I say the Pumas? Yeah, that's uh, the problem when South Africa plays. Um, <laughs> South Africa plays Argentina, the Pumas, I never lose and I never win. (laughs) (laughs) So I I never know who who to support all those days. I suppose the guy that wins. And then a lot of football, uh, a little bit of football, yeah. I like sports Mm -hmm. and I used to play a lot of football in Argentina and and I played a little bit of rugby. Yeah, I enjoy it, but I I don't spend too much time except when we have a World Cup or something that I'm onto it. Absolutely onto it. It's coming up soon. (laughs) What would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever received? I think... um, Believe in yourself and don't let anybody tell you anything about what you should be doing or what not. I found in life that uh, when you are passionate about something and you think it's going to work and you you have um, enough energy and put a lot of passion, you know, it will work. And you mustn't pay attention to what people say, you just do your own thing. If you make a mistake, then you made a a valuable mistake. But uh, I think the the biggest sin would be sitting and doing nothing. Mm. Very sage advice indeed. Are you into music? Is that something that's part of your life? I am. I love music. Uh, I download. um, It's amazing how it's changed. You know, before you had to buy CDs, then you could download music and now you can basically get it for free, it's incredible. So yeah, I have a lot of uh, music at the moment and um, what kind of music I listen to? Indie, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, if you could share a bottle of wine with anyone, alive or dead who would it be and what wine would it be any wine any wine in in the world what would it be I will share with uh, Mignon my girlfriend and Kiki and one or two friends that really uh, enjoy wine and they they pay attention to what I'm doing and which bottle I would drink probably a nice burgundy Um, yeah really or a champagne bottle. Mm. Now we're talking. <laughs> Can I join this party? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
What sort of wines do you think will be drunk in the year 2300? Very clean, natural, linear, pure, simple, uh, bright, honest, loving wines. I like all of those words. I know, me too. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I want to be there in 2300. <laughs> okay, so... The aliens love this thing called wine that you've introduced them to. And they want to take you back to meet their leader on whatever planet they're from. And they've asked you to bring three wines with. Any three wines again from anywhere in the world. Which three wines do you take with? I'll bring the wines that I make because um, I'm, I'm very proud about them. I understand what they are about and they are good enough to share with my friends uh, up there. Very, very cool. I like that. Confidence. Is there a winemaking area anywhere in the world that you would like to explore? Yes, I would like to go uh, and look at Georgia to see how they're making their orange wines and the Friuli also. Those two areas are not too far away. And I would like to go and chat to to uh, people to see uh, what is it that, that they do that is so different. A couple of, two years ago I had, uh, was in one of your shows in, um, in the Amsterdam and I was talking to a doctor that was making wine in Georgia and he was showing one of the wines there and, uh, and it was wonderful to see how they go about the making the wines, looking what is the weather going to be before we op- open the quarry, and when are they going to praise, and so connected to the earth, and so connected to what's going on out there. It was fascinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we we also doing biodynamic um, viticulture and trying to make biodynamic w- w- wines in a biodynamic way. And I thought those guys, without really knowing very much what biodynamic was, what they were really listening to what was going on out there before they did anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a lifestyle. It yeah. definitely is a lifestyle. I'm almost done, but before I finish, I want to play a little game. So I'm going to name three different wine varieties or styles and I want you to pair each of those with a song or a music artist or a composer or a genre or something that you feel represents that variety or style. Okay. All right. Let's start with Viognier. The Cure. Love it. Love it. I can listen to The Cure any time of day. (laughs) Okay. Roussan. Roussan Elbow. There's a, a little band in UK called Elbo, and they do that nice melodic music uh, with the the, the Rusan can talk to. I know Elbo, build a rocket. Yeah. Uh, very very cool, uh, listeners. Look up Elbo. Um, okay, let's go with orange wine as a style. Hmm. Uh, of monsters and men mm-hmm. of monsters and men there you go there you have it billy thank you so much for joining me today it was an absolute pleasure chatting to you it was awesome thank you so much it's so much fun we'll do it again I hope so. Before we finish up, can you please tell our listeners where they can find Nativo online, on social media, 
any of any of that information and if they were ever to come to South Africa where could they find you so you do uh, the Hughes family you google the Hughes family wines or Nantibo wines you get to our website and you send either me or my daughter Kiki an email and we will tell you where you can find the wines in South Africa or any other part of the world if we have it and I'm sure you will make a plan to get it anywhere in the world as well <laughs> Billy thank you so much for the opportunity thank you so much it was awesome Bye-bye. thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack South Africa for details and updates visit our website winesoundtrack.com <laughs> <laughs>